webinar today. Um, my name is Heather Martz Keller. I'm a marketing associate here at DTC. For those of you who don't know exactly what DTC is, in short, we are an IT company, specifically a managed service provider. However, we like to host these webinars every once in a while to just kind of be a resource to all and focus our efforts on topics that we feel like need more connectivity. So today, I am sitting down with the wonderful Andrew Rose to talk about the future of food and agriculture, specifically cell-based meats and alternative proteins. So Andrew, I will turn it over to you for introductions. Great. Thank you, Heather. Uh, my name is Andrew Rose, as Heather mentioned there. Um, I like to call myself a futurist, and a lot of people say, well, what is a futurist? Can you predict my future? Are you a human Ouija board? And the answer there is mm, maybe. Um, what I like to do is identify certain data points that occur in the future and then draw lines between those points and influence events if possible. Typically, I'm about five years in the future is where I set my, my line down. And uh, so, so a lot of things that, that happen today don't necessarily concern me because I'm, I'm sure that we'll figure things out in five years and we'll be able to, to go on to the, the next stage of things. One of the, it's either a blessing or a curse. I've been afflicted with a lifelong um, desire to learn about everything. And one of the subjects I've spent a lot of time exploring is cell-based meat. And for those of you out there who kind of ask why cell-based meat, why is it important to have more protein available for the global diet? And if you think about certain countries that might be transitioning from second world to first world countries, as their middle class grows, they're demanding more protein in their diets. So anything that we can do to increase the uh, supply and availability of protein to these parts of the world is always a net positive. And I do want to be very clear on the outset of this, that this is not an either or discussion. This is not cell based meat versus traditional or conventional um, meat. It, this is a broad tent. Um, agriculture encompasses a lot of viewpoints. Um, we have conventional agriculture, we have organic agri agriculture, and they all exist together. Um, and I think what we need to focus on are the, the fantastic business opportunities that are made available in this space. So the first question I have is, what is cell-based meat? What, what do we call it? it? How, How do we define, define it? it? I mean, this, this, this whole category, category is, is the script is being written pretty much as, as we're talking today. today. Now, if you are a conventional agriculturalist, a member of the U.S. Cattlemen's Association, um, you might take off offense at cell-based meat. And they did take offense at cell-based meat, and they have sued to um, or petitioned to have the word meat defined a specific way on the labels. And they would like to have meat or beef defined as something that's derived from an animal that was born, raised, and harvested in a traditional manner. Now, the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, and the FDA, the Food Drug Administration, have come together jointly to regulate the cell-based meat um, space. The first iteration of that regulation is asking for opinions. <clears throat> So the USDA's Food Safety Inspection Service, or we'll call FSIS, um, has been collecting information and, and issuing some, some uh, decrees, and they have denied the U.S. cattlemen's petition about to limit the definition of beef and meat. Instead, they went and embraced Harvard's suggestion to take a labeling approach for cell-based products that do not require new standards of identity. Because if you think about it, if <clears throat> cell-based meat is required to carry different labels or descriptions or words, that's a whole nother area that we need to create within our government for regulatory purposes. So rather than, than taking that whole additional step, let's just kind of all agree that under a microscope, it's indistinguishable from um, traditional um, born, raised, and harvested meat versus something that was raised in a bioreactor. Um, the EFSIS has responded recently in a publication that is actively expanding its knowledge of cell-based meat and poultry products so it can effectively oversee the safety and labeling of these products. Um, now, just from, again, someone <clears throat> who's a lifelong learner, I would love to be in those meetings that EFSIS is in while they're collecting all these opinions um, about what to call it. <clears throat> Today's session, we're talking about cell-based meat, but that is not the only 
alternative protein that's out there. Um, many of you are familiar with the plant-based products, Impossible Burgers, Beyond. Um, Impossible is a soy-based um, plant um, burger that tries to mimic the regular hamburger feel. Beyond is based on a yellow pea product. Um, it's a purist is the, the brand of yellow pea there. Um, impossible. And again, this is all personal preference. I have done taste tests between the two of them. I've prepared them identically. <clears throat> I had a, a cheeseburger with some melted cheddar on it with both of them. I personally liked Impossible better. I know there's some people out there going to hate me for saying that. I thought it had a better mouthfeel to it. I, I felt it, be it best mimicked a hamburger. And I was not looking at any kind of nutritional um, labeling. I was simply based on um, how, I, how it felt in my mouth and how it tasted and, and what have you. Um, one of the drawbacks or one of the stated drawbacks of Impossible is people do have soy allergies. So that is why Beyond is a, a, a good substitute. And also don't draw your opinions on where the product is today or where it was yesterday. It is rapidly evolving. Um, it's evolving both for the taste texture, but also for the micronutrients within it. They're always trying to make it better. And this is an overarching um, drive from most of the major food brands is to have healthier for you products that still taste fantastic and, and fulfill all those other needs. There's some other types of alternative proteins that are out there. Some are yeast based, some are mycology based, mushroom based, algae based. And yes, Heather, there is even one that is air based. So you ask, Andrew, how is that even possible? How do you, how do you make protein out of air? It seems like that would be almost limitless. And it could be. Um, so from their website, um, Air Protein is crafted by world-renowned chefs to recreate the flavor, texture, and taste of chicken, fish, beef, and pork with no animals, soy, hormones, pesticides, herbicides, or GMOs. It features more protein per, per kilogram than any other meat source and is rich in vitamins, minerals, and amino acids. And for me, that's the one thing that people really need to pay attention to is the nine essential amino acids. If you are having a plant-based alternative product, do, does it have the, the right amino acid structures in it for your human, for your body, for your physiology? If it doesn't, you probably won't notice that as you eat it, digest it, and consume it, your body will eventually notice there's a lack of something in there. <clears throat> so I... I if they aren't already, I do employ implore the uh, plant-based protein sector to um, ensure that the right amino acid structures are in there. Now, Heather, prior to this starting, you and I were a, having a conversation, and you mentioned something. There is a gateway drug into all of these things. And do you know what that is? It's bacon. If you can replicate bacon, I don't care if it's mushroom-based, plant-based, cell-based meat, that is that that's that entry point that a human being will can start consuming that product line so if you look at what types of products are coming out obviously hamburgers are fairly easy and we'll get into why's later you're starting to see a lot of bacon popping up in there and that's because they, the brands know that if we can hook them on the bacon then they're going to buy the sausage and the hamburger patties and hopefully the chicken wings and what have you <clears throat> so for our vast audience out there listening right now um, i do have a question for you what do we call this? What do we call cell-based meat? You know, it's, well, I kind of gave a hint there. Cell-based meat is what I tend to call it, but there are a lot of names out there. Heather, have you heard any names for this? I have not. Um, besides the alternative proteins, um, I've heard a lot of names that I know do not actually explain what it is. And it's more so along the side of the skeptics, those who don't want anything to do with the alternative proteins, the cell-based meat, as it is fake meat. And I do want to interrupt you for one second. We do have a bit of an echo. Good, Good Lord. Lord. Yeah. <laughs> so I have been turning off my mic. So I don't know if you would like to use one mic. Oh, yeah, yeah your mic is on, on too, too, isn't it? Um, I, don't, I don't care. I can turn mine off. Okay. And then we can just use yours. Sounds good. Well, hopefully it sounds good. We'll find out. <laughs> okay. Can the audience hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you, Victoria. I appreciate okay. that. Okay. You. So you touched on one of the, the other terms, fake meat. 
yes. is something that you will often hear from people in the livestock industry. It's a direct, derisive term. Um, which, you know, given the perspective, I completely uh, understand that Franken food is another one you might hear from that sector. Yes. Um, in my research, I've heard a lot of terms, meat 2.0, lab grown meat, that was an early one, mm -hmm. cultured meat, which I think, you know, that one might have some legs and traction to a clean meat. You know, that's sort of the alternative to fake meat that people want to say, well, no, yes. we're, we're better than getting this. Not a, not a fight I want to engage in, cell based meat, obviously. And then what I'm hearing from the scientist is cellular, cellular agriculture. So there, there is a, this is still an area that's being defined. The EPSIS will um, help a lot in that labeling. I think ultimately it's just going to be called me. I yeah. think, you know, give it five years. One of the questions here was what is this going to look like in five or 10 years? It's going to look like me. It's going to be indistinguishable from me. And, and if you think about it, you're going to be getting the cuts of meat you want. You're going to be getting your chicken breast without the feathers or the head or the legs or anything like that. You're or going to be getting, legs. correct. You're going to be getting your cow without the move. You know, it's just the steak part that you want to consume there. So there are a lot of benefits to, to doing this piece. Um, fun fact, one of the easiest meats to make in a laboratory is chicken. And there's, there's some reasons why. Um, number one, when you when you cut into a steak, you want to see some liquid come out. You want the blood and the yeah. serum to ooze out. When you cut into a chicken, that's not necessarily an expectation. So you don't have to worry a whole lot about bleeding when that happens. The one drawback or the one issue that the chicken industry, the um, cell-based meat chicken industry is running into is price point. It's still a lot cheaper to create a chicken through conventional methods than it is in a reactor. Um, so that's one of those things. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the chicken coming out. Um, when they made the first cell-based hamburger back in 2013, it was estimated it would cost about $300,000 per hamburger. That price point has dropped significantly in the um, eight years uh, since then. And I think we will see price parity within the next five to 10 years with the cell-based meat. One of the, um, the ways that companies are using to get into the cell-based meat space quietly or, or gently, I should say, is blending it with plants. And if you think about it, um, we are used to having um, mushrooms blended into our hamburger meat mm -hmm. and things like that. So there's already a consumer acceptance for that blending. I think that a lot of companies are going to start using that same methodology to start introducing cell-based meat into um, the, um, the diet of, of their consumers. All right, so that's a side. And let I me mean, check here, no questions on my opening. So we'll <laughs> dive right into it. So in order for you to have cell-based meat, you've got to start at the beginning with a stem cell. Mm -hmm. And it's not just any stem cell. It's got to be a mortal. Oh, and that sounds pretty cool. That sounds like a Marvel movie, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly. <laughs> so uh, what is an immortal stem cell line? So an immortal cell, um, it's kind of gross to think about it, but cancer cells are immortal. I mean, they basically you can keep on replicating and replicating without any degradation of the DNA or um, breaking down the way a normal human cell would. Um, if you want to have a, um, a mortal stem cell line of a bison, for example, it is really, really hard to get those cells not to die off after several generations, to always continue along and what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the research that's out there, most people start with the cancer cells from mice, and they will do certain things to them to allow them to transport or interact with other cells. Um, I'm not a, a real expert on immortal stem cell lines, but I did see a neat study of using viruses as a delivery method to get the DNA into other cells. Um, so stay tuned right there. Um, there is one company out there I want to give a shout out to, and that's Orbillion Bio. Um, I have a lot of respect for them. Um, they, in, I don't know, three years, two years, have gone from just post-ideation to oversubscribed on their initial raise. So congratulations to Patricia and, and her team out there. Um, what they are doing is building um, a library of immortal stem cells so that if you came to them as a, um, as a CPG company or consumer uh, product company mm -hmm. and said, hey, I want to have a kangaroo steak, they could go into the library and not only identify an immortal stem cell line that would have would be the kangaroo, the appropriate kangaroo meat that you're looking for, 
Um, they also know what is the best way to raise it, grow it, replicate it, differentiate it, and all those other things that you need to need to do to have a successful cell-based meat product line. Um, now, I've been told, and, and this is probably true, but I, I could not find any kind of um, article to support this, but I've been told that to be defined as an immortal stem cell line, that replications need to occur 60 generations without any kind of degradation or fault within the outcome product. So um, that may or may not be the, the case. I do um, recommend that you watch the, the pitch from Orbillion. Um, and what I'm gonna do right now is drop it in the chat box so our vast audience around the globe can see this here. Oh, well, thank you for advancing the slide there too. I appreciate that. Of course. Um, <clears throat> So we'll go on to the next one. This is a fun topic. It's kind of gross, but it's a lot of fun. Media. And when I first heard them say the word media, I'm like, the television? Newspaper media? Media is the, the, the slurry that these, these baby cells are dropped into, and they feed upon this media, and they replicate and divide. Gotcha. So the best media in the world is called fetal bovine serum. That even sounds gross. Even not knowing what fetal bovine serum is, <laughs> Serum is it's you know it's distasteful at least uh, in some people's minds. It's used quite a bit in the biomedical industry, and you're going to see a lot of the technology crosses over from biomedicine into the cell-based meat that we're discussing today because they've done a pretty good job putting together heart walls or kidney structure or skin grafts or things like that. So there's a lot of lessons that we can learn, and in the um, biomedical world, fetal bovine serum is used quite a bit. So when you, we'll talk about dairy cows, for example. So when a dairy cow reaches the end of its life and its milk production has gone down, um, there's still money to be made from that animal. So it's sent off to slaughter and then it's used for different meat byproducts. Roughly 7% of the cows sent to slaughter are pregnant. So what the slaughter company will do is they remove that fetus, they clean it, then they desiccate it, drain it of all of its blood, then they process that. So they separate the blood from the serum. And, and I've watched the, the process. It's, there's a lot of freezing and unfreezing and centrifuges and what have you. But the end result is you get this, this, this graph, with a graph of serum that goes for about $1,000 a liter. So that, that serum is worth a whole lot more than that cow is at slaughter. So it's some, something that's sought after. Um, the videos I've watched are very careful to talk about how clean this is and there's no contaminants, but you're still using a biological uh, liquid then to grow your cells. So we're kind of getting, it's, you know, it's still sort of chemistry, but it's also biology. Um, so in addition to the, the potential for pathogens or other things to be in that serum or to get in there and grow, um, it's also got a little bit of an ick factor. You know, people understand kind of where that came from. So it's now... <laughs> Heather, you used to be a vegan and a vegetarian, right? Yes. <laughs> um, when, when you chose the, those paths, was there a specific reason? Was it health? Was it animal related? It was a bit of both. Um, all throughout my life, I've never been much of a meat eater anyway. So I wanted to try on the vegetarian portion of it. And truthfully, I kind of like the unknowingness at least a few years back of like, what exactly am I eating? And it had me a whole lot more health conscious as to what exactly I am eating. Um, and then the veg or the vegan bit of it was I started to have allergic reactions and we couldn't figure out, it was this two year time frame of a bunch of tests, skin tests, graphs of trying to figure out what in the world is wrong with me. And after doing a few skin tests, it turns out I'm allergic to basically everything in the environment, but I wanted to do my due diligence, kind of remove certain food groups, see if different alternatives had a better effect on me or a worse effect. Um, so that's where the vegan bit came from. So in answer to your question, both animal and health related. And it, the, the animal side of that is, is critical because there is a lot of interest in the vegan and vegetarian community about cell-based meat because it removes the animal cruelty yeah. part. No animals were killed in the biopsy with the initial cells taken out typically. Um, so the, you don't have to worry about the whole slaughterhouse rendering and all the other things that go into that except for the fetal bovine serum. So <laughs> it's kind of hard to, to draw a line and say you're, you're animal friendly if you're using the fetal bovine serum yeah. as a media. And, and the industry knows this, and so they're looking at a, 
a ton of different alternatives. And, and because we're, we're mimicking biology, it's hard. It's really, really difficult to do this. So the two companies that I'm keeping an eye on, one is called Orf, O-R-F, out of Iceland, of all places. And, you know, I love the names of the people and the towns. It's nothing that I can ever repronounce yeah. into you. There's a lot of um, hard consonants in there, but it's so cool. And that the fact that ORF, and you can see a picture there of one of their facilities, is using barley as that media. And I, I have watched several scientific presentations about how they do it. And I'm not a scientist. I mean, I just trust they know what they're doing. It looks good. I think they, they've got that going on. Um, but keep an eye on them. Um, they, they've been more than just on the periphery. They are a major player in the alternative media space. And if you're an investor or otherwise, they might be someone that you want to uh, pay close attention to. Another one that I like a lot, it's called Future Fields. And they're up in Canada. And um, I'm not going to share their, let's see if I say yet. I'm not going to share where they were because I think that's more proprietary and I, I kind of learned some information there, but here's where they are. They have found that insects might be a way to generate um, excess media. And just from the little bit I looked at, they're um, somehow inserting something into a fruit fly and the fruit fly then will have a secretion and that secretion then can become part of or precursor to the media they're looking at. So you're going you're gonna to hear insects out there. And I think that because we're a first world country, we don't pay as much attention to the potential of insects as other parts of the world do. Um, just as a footnote, insects are cold blooded, so we don't need to have any kind of, you know, keeping them warm in the winter, things like that. You can get multiple generations in one year. Mm -hmm. um, so five generations, nine generations. Insects will often consume waste products from us that could be discarded food, uh, spoiled food. I mean, the black soldier flies will pretty much eat anything you put in front of them. Um, mealworms will eat styrofoam, and they poop out antifreeze, which is the most bizarre thing in the world <laughs> I've ever heard of. Um, but if you think about terrestrial insects, um, you can equate them to aquatic proteins. So the shrimp, the crabs, lobsters that we consume, there is usually some sort of correlation to some some creature on the face of this planet. Because we're a first world country, though, we detest eating insects in the form that we see them in. We need to have them turn into flour or a liquid or something like that, and then we'll consume them. We're not going to be um, asking for extra crickets on top of our salads and croutons the way we might in other countries. Um, but keep, keep an eye on insects. There is a ton of promise in this space. So the next slide is scaffolding. And we're going to spend a little time talking about scaffolding. And well, Heather, when you hear the word scaffolding, what do you think of? I my head normally goes to the scaffolding of like a building or construction architecture, not anything really having to do along the lines of food at all. Yes. So when we're talking about cell-based meat, you know, if you if you kind of close your eyes and visualize a petri dish full of some sort of agar or medium that the cells grow, and you drop a cell in there. That expands outward, sort of in a, in a two-dimensional fashion. It's just a, a bunch of mush. There, there's no structure to hold it together. In order for us to, to have these cells replicate in such a way that, that creates a steak or a chicken wing or something like that, there needs to be layers. There needs to be a lot of stuff going on. In order for those cells to, to kind of grow and, and create those, those types of things that we're accustomed to, we need some sort of um, scaffolding or a platform or lattice work for them to hold on to. This is a really hot area of exploration in the cell-based meat world right now. Um, the easiest thing to think about is if you take um, like a spinach leaf and you pull, you de decellularize it. So you take all the insides out through a chemical process. I think they use enzymes to do so. And you're left with just the, the veins, these hollow tubes. Now we can put the, the stem cells in the, the liquid, drop this in there or have that in there first, and the, cell, the cells will start adhering to those, those veins, those tubes, and growing around that. Um, so not only does it provide them a scaffold or something to hold on to, it also, it, those tubes are hollow. 
So now we can get food into those inner cells and we can get the cell poop out of there. So it's a good way to transport the food and waste um, to the cells there as well. Another, I guess we call it a hurdle of using um, of different types of scaffolding is the myoblast, the, the cells, the stem cells, um, they aren't static. They don't just sit there. They move, they grow, they flex. And when they do that, if the scaffolding is too brittle, they can deform it, they can break it. It won't have the, the, um, the weight-bearing capabilities that is needed to create a stake or ribeye or something like that. Um, I've seen some recent research in using soy as a scaffolding. And, and the benefits to using soy are obviously huge. It's, it's a plant that we're very familiar with. We've done a lot of genetic engineering with soy, and it's something that is um, fairly biocompatible with most human beings. And that, that's an area I would, I would certainly want to keep a look at. Again, you want it to be porous, though. You don't want the, the scaffolding to be rigid where, where liquids can't um, come in through their... We good? Okay, cool. Um, it, we want it to be semi-permeable, so it, it provides both structure, weight-bearing capabilities, but also the ability to transport nutrients in and um, any kind of waste material out. And if you think about the scaffolding, too, um, it's got to be compatible with the cells that are in there. We talked a little bit about our orbillion. So if I placed an order for some bison stem cells, um, I'm going to want to have a scaffold in that can support those stem cells. It's not just a stem cell that makes muscle, I might want to have um, a stem cell that makes fat or a ligament. And knowing what scaffolding th those those cells can adhere to is critical in creating that, that bison steak that I'm, I'm accustomed to, to looking at. Another neat thing is when you start putting a whole bunch of, of stem cells together, in order for them to make a muscle, there's sort of a wrapping, like a ribbon that wraps around them. And when you cook that piece of meat, that ribbon both unwinds and shrinks, and that's what kind of makes the, the meat tender so you can eat it. Whatever scaffolding is in there has to replicate that same unwinding, that shrinkage, that ability. So as you can see, the, the science behind this is a lot more difficult than just something that you would just say, hey, let's just take a spinach leaf and throw some cells in there and see what happens. Um, the one I like a lot, and this one's got some drawbacks, is alginate. So using an algae byproduct as your scaffolding. I love it because you've got hopefully potential omega-3 benefits. Um, I think algae is a really cool product. It's easy to grow. The drawback is, however, that if you use algae as your scaffolding, you might come up with some green meat. And um, green meat is not something that's typically sought after in the butcher's aisle. Um, I think as a species, it might be good for us to start embracing green meat. And who knows, maybe that's a whole new marketing campaign that can occur. Why not Why not celebrate the greenness of our meat and, and talk about the benefits of that rather than saying it looks or tastes just like conventional meat? Yeah, it could be an opportunity. One of the more successful scaffolds out there is collagen. Heather, do you know how they get collagen? Do you know where it comes from? Elastin? So one place they get it from are um, rendering plants. And for those of you who are familiar with rendering plants, maybe you've driven through um, Front Royal, Virginia, and, you know, five miles outside of town, you start smelling something, and it gets more pungent as you get towards it. A rendering plant basically gathers all the um, offtake from slaughter facilities, um, euthanized pets. I don't know if they do roadkill or not. But anyway, they put them in big vats, and they do some stuff, and they grind them up, and they boil them. And on top of that, um, liquid, and I'm, I'm up way oversimplifying this, is the collagen and elastin. And they scrape that off and they use that for a multitude of things. Um, it forms one of the foundational pieces of the cosmetic industry. Um, but also for our, our purposes here, we use um, collagen is a fantastic scaffold for these. But if we're trying to get away from using animal products in our cell-based meat, um, deceased animal products, I should say, in our cell-based meat, we might want to look at getting something else um, <clears throat> rather than collagen, but, we're, but they're getting there. Um, another piece too, and I don't know if this is a fun fact or what have you, but I, I've read that um, any cell in the, the media needs to be within 200 micrometers of whatever it is that it's feeding upon. So if you have scaffolding that, that 
um, inhibits that cell from gathering the food that it needs, then it probably won't be um, a successful cell or a successful gathering. So um, in addition to the global um, Google um, outage for their services, we just experienced a, a global microphone outage, right? That's pretty cool. All right. Anyway, so back to the vascular systems. My favorite steak on the planet is a ribeye, which is represented here. Um, I Even though I may have had a full breakfast today, I look at that and I still, I'm a human being. It looks good. I can imagine that thing cooking up and um, being a steak on the grill. Um, if we want to get to that point using cell-based meat, we're going to need three Ds. So we talked about the scaffold that goes in there. Something else, and, and we mentioned it, was was those tubes. So the, the cells on the inside can get the, all the different types of nutrients they need. But when they get overloaded and full, they got to poop that stuff out or excrete it out. And we need to have a tube that takes that outward. So the vascular systems, and a lot of this is going to be determined by the scaffolding that you use. Some scaffolding might even have, like we talked about, the veins, holes already in there. But sometimes you're going to need to introduce um, these, these types of vascular systems. And it's in sure. It is important that these cells are happy, that they grow, that they, they turn and differentiate in a lot of things. But those vascular systems, they also have a benefit that they feel good when we bite into them. You know, it's not just a mush burger that we get. We get, we get some tension in there. And we'll talk a little bit more about mouthfeel in a minute. But um, just understand, and here's something else that, I, that I, I picked up at a conference. I have not been able to confirm it, but I was told that once cells get to be more than one millimeter thick, they require those vascular tubes in order to, to bring um, food and, and exit waste out of there. So keep that in the back of your mind. If someone can confirm that, fantastic. So we want to move ahead in the next slide here. <clears throat> Fats and ligaments. Oh, boy, you talk about get something that makes you hungry here. So we discussed where the, the collagens and, uh, and elastins come from. Um, we, the, my fibrils, um, these are muscle fibers. They really, really matter a lot. Um, and when we talk about fats and ligaments, yeah, we could maybe from a couple stem cells make a whole cow, but why do we do that? We only want to make the parts that we want to consume. And we do want to consume some muscle fiber, some ligaments, some other things like that. Because if you think about it, um, well, Heather, you've had an Impossible Burger, right? And you've had a regular hamburger, right? Okay, taste aside. Talk to me about that mouth feel. How, how are they different? How are they similar? And when you bite into that, and what does that feel on your like on your tongue? Okay. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you a word of the day. And I'm going to type it right in here. You're going to be so excited that I've told you about this word. Called organoleptic. So, organoleptic means that your senses are the, the feeling you get when you when you bite into a burger from your the way you see it, the way you smell it, the way you taste it, all those things. That is, those are the organoleptic properties. It's not health-based. It's just kind of how you, how you feel about um, this meat that you're consuming. One of the other things, too, going back to insects <clears throat> that, that surprised me was insects also have muscles. They also do these things, and it, it appears that um, putting insect muscles um, into our cell-based meat could be a, a great alternative to trying to replicate a, um, a mammalian um, type of muscle. So keep an eye on that. And let's go back to that mouthfeel. When I sat down in a room several years ago with the CEOs of some of the largest food companies, the one thing that they, they all agreed on was it doesn't matter how healthy or how good or what benefit there is of this food product, if it doesn't taste good, if it doesn't have a good mouthfeel. And a mouth feel is so critical if, if you're in the food industry. So um, a potato chip needs to have a certain pounds per square inch crunch to be optimal. I can't remember if it was two or four pounds per square inch. And that that's 
from a human being standpoint, that's exactly the crunch we expect from a potato chip. So they're all fairly standard as they go across. But, you know, what are you going to do? Am I going to get a whole bunch of, of um, Heathers and Victorias to sit in a room and eat potato chips and tell me which one's the best? Yeah, maybe I'll do that. Or maybe there's a machine out there. And there is, as a matter of fact, um, audience. It's called a, a texture analyzer. And it's and it's, it's just a, a mechanical mouth. And it does a lot of things. And it measures um, different properties of this food. It measures... Um, when you bite into a burger and you talked about the, the juices, it measure, measures the, the moisture released in your mouth. Um, it measures bounce back. So if you think of a shrimp, you know, what's that, that springiness? Does it pull apart? Does it bounce back? That, that little, little burst you get. Um, it measures gel strength. Gel strength. So if you picture in your head a, a block of fat and you poke it with your finger, that's the gel strength. So what does that look like? What's the elasticity of that? So this machine will measure all that. So whatever the outcome is from our cell base, whatever product that is, it needs to have all those essential things that feel right to our mouths or we're going to be more reluctant to consume it. So these are all the different types of variables that are included in that equation, and the outcome then will be your, your state. Um, so let's talk a little about the, the production and the, um, the bioreactor. How are we doing on time? I'm, we're good? Excellent. That's fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Um, so bioreactors. So these meats that we are talking about here are not grown on an idyllic looking farm somewhere, the, the type of thing that you probably imagine in your head when you think about agriculture. They're grown in these vats, which look a lot more like a brewery. You know, if you're making whiskey or scotch or beer, you have large stainless steel tanks like this. And this is this is um, the way that we're currently growing our, our cell based meat. And it's important that we have this. This is this is the farm for these cells. And we want them to go in these baths of serum, um, whether it's fetal bovine serum or barley based. We want them to grow and be happy and differentiate. So it's not all just muscle. Some might turn into bone, some might turn into fat, some might turn into vascular tissue. Um, but we want them to do it in a, in a way that is is replicable and consistent and that we have a timeline that fits into the needs of the end consumer. So there's a couple of different ways that bioreactors work. The first one, the easiest one, is called a batch. So if you think one of those big tanks there, you put all your liquid in there, you plop your cells in, and you stand back and wait. You know, cells will eat the liquid, they'll consume it. You can kind of visualize this in your head, and they'll, they'll get to a certain size, and then you'll scrape them off or harvest them in some way. The next is called a fed batch, and this is kind of like um, trickle feeding the cells. So they start in a, in a finite amount of liquid, and then in, over time, you, you pour more liquid in there, and the, the cells will consume that. Then the last kind, which I think is pretty cool, is called continuous perfusion. Um, and that, if you imagine, is kind of like a river. So you put the cells in there, and there's incoming media, and there's outgoing media, so that it'll get cleansed and recycled. And then that way, too, you can always have almost a continuous harvest of these cells. So once they get to a certain size, you lift them out, drop the other ones in, you know, oversimplifying how that's, that's done. Um, but that gives you, um, you can get a high cell density in there. It's easily scalable. Um, and they use something called a hollow fiber membrane. And if you're trying to picture what this looks like in your head, think of a tanning bed with the tubes in there for the lights, but instead of, instead of um, filaments in there, that's where the, the, um, the food and the waste material move back and forth. So the cells are able to kind of be molded into those shapes they want to be molded into. So if you're trying to build a muscle fiber or a ligament, um, my fibrosis of some sort, you can, you can use this, this function there. So keep an eye on that one. Um, a couple of the types out there, just for those of you that are interested in the answers to the next Jeopardy question. Um, we have fluidized beds, um, agitators with rotating walls, wave rocking beds, and airlifts. You know, I don't, it sounds almost kind of like I'm driving a tractor trailer or something like that, but these are the new types of bioreactors on the market. 
And there's a new there's a new product out there for all you um, want to be entrepreneurs, and it's a buyer reactor as a service because, as you can probably imagine, these things aren't cheap. So if there's a way for you to rent space in one of these, um, very similar to some of the breweries in downtown Baltimore where we're sitting today, um, where if you're a startup craft brewer, you can go in there and have access to these machineries until you get yourself up and running. So Culture Biosciences has buyer reactors as a service, from what I've been told. So let's talk about processing here. You know, this is where we start getting some fun stuff. Any questions there that I need to address? Have I skipped over something that we need to discuss? Let's see here. Yes, I just see that. Okay. So Victoria, I will address your question in a little bit. The short answer is no. I mean, at the end of the day, people have to eat, so it's we're less concerned about what is in our food, the hungrier we are, and that's kind of the way it plays out. So processing, you know, how do, how do we take this, um, this stuff and get it prepared for you and I to consume? Um, I did watch a long video on multi-layer electrospinning. Um, I don't really understand it, but it looked pretty cool, and it kind of was like cotton candy. So they, they take all these threads and tendrils of growth media that the cells would adhere to, and they put them either in a, I might be wrong here, um, so please don't hate me, two-dimensional or three-dimensional, and they will then cross-hatch them as they grow up there, and that makes it a, a neat way to do it. You've probably seen the images of the 3D printed meat. It looks a lot like Play-Doh being extruded out of a, like a, I don't know, end of a hollow pen or something like that. Maybe when it's heated, it's going to look a little bit better, but it, it basically looks like cake fondant that's been, you know, shaped together in a meat fashion. I don't know how, how realistic the images are as to what the real process looks like. I don't have a whole lot of visibility in there. Hmm. Um, extrusion is probably the, the uh, most common way that we're going to see this hit the plate to begin with. Extrusion kind of it is what it sounds like. So basically, you're, you're with high pressure squeezing this product through a tube so it comes out in a certain form. And sometimes, if impossible, the extrusion aligns plant fibers in such a way that they kind of sort of mimic um, the animal that they're trying to replicate. Um, we're still, I should say, we they are still working on it because when they do it in that form and fashion. The end product, plant-based end product, tends to be closer to um, well-done meat than it does to a raw meat. So, it, again, going back to the mouthfeel, we want to make sure that does that appropriately. But if we're talking about cell-based meat, before we start putting scaffolding and all the ligaments and vascular systems in there, we got this mush of cells. So the early products that we saw on the market were just basically cells mushed together into meatballs. Because you don't need muscle or, or you don't need bone in a meatball, and that's how you do it. So extrusion would fit well into that process where you're taking a bunch of um, cells that haven't adhered to really anything, pushing them through a tube, and having an end result. So a hamburger, you can kind of you don't need a whole lot of, of muscle structure with the hamburger. You still need to have the little chunks of ligament and bone and other things like that that you get in there, but fat for the, for the most part. Um, so extrusion, I think, will be the first one. I'm not quite sure what the next iteration is going to be. Um, but at the end of the day, well, actually, let me, let me go back to um, on the slide here. You see in the upper left hand corner a company called Super Meat. And I give Super Meat all the credit in the world. They have pulled off something remarkable. Because when we start talking about the consumer, who gets this piece of meat, um, there's kind of two thoughts out there in the cell based meat industry. One, is large production. So you can kind of imagine a ribeye, like a, like a ship's rope, a ribeye that's 40 feet long that's just cut into the ribeyes. That's one way to produce this. The other way is what super meat is doing here. Super meat started with chicken. Um, again, chicken is one of the easiest ones to replicate, but they have the ability to look at different types of um, proteins that they can, they can come out of here. And if you think about a brew pub, you know, sometimes you go in and they got a special beer of the month or the week, and they've done it right there on site. This is the exact same model that Super Meat's using. So they are make, creating that chicken in the back in those vats, and they serve it up front in the restaurant in Israel. Um, you can go to their website. I think it's supermeat.com, and you can actually reserve a table there and go in there. And I'm sure it's not cheap, but it's a novelty, you know, and um, it, the price points will continue to drop. There is another company in Israel called the Future Meat Technology. Um, 
I give Israel a lot of credit. They're, they're, you know, I thought Singapore was one of the leads in this, but Israel is certainly, um, I won't call them punching above their weight class because everyone expects Israel to outperform, but this is really exciting news here. The, I do want to talk a little bit about Singapore because if you're into the cell-based meat movement, obviously Singapore is the center of the universe. Um, Singapore did something really brilliant. When they first started their cell-based meat movement, they invited the regulators in to the planning sessions. So the people that are going to oversee them are helping them define the processes, the protocols, all the procedures they have. So it's not like taking a test and waiting for your grade. You've got the teacher in there helping you write the answers. Um, and by doing so, they've gone to market much faster than most other countries on the planet have. Um, I did ask some of the CEOs of some of the largest um, cell-based meat companies about what does the future look like for them? Does Singapore want to be one of the worldwide exporters of proteins? Because they could. They've got all the company, they got most of the companies there. And their answer was no. Um, they don't have the energy needed to produce enough meat to feed the globe. What they do have, however, is the IP. So they're going to be the ones that then will sell or license the equipment to other countries companies and countries to use to, to create these types of cell-based meats. So the, the question I really have for the audience today is um, for those of you who are um, vegans, vegetarians, uh, vegan friendlies, um, what do you think about this? I mean, is this, is this something that you would consider consuming if we remove all the animal products from um, the cell-based meat? from the, the little bits of uh, focus groups that I've done, um, the answer is not monolithic, it, it's split. There are certain people who choose a vegan or vegetarian lifestyle because they just don't like animals. They don't like eating animals, I should say. They don't, they don't like the flavor, the taste, the, the structure of it. But others um, are, are very um, excited that there's no animal cruelty involved in the processing this and they can go back to creating this um, there is an entrepreneur down in texas and um i believe she, i believe she's a vegan if, if not a vegan a vegetarian um well thank you brand i appreciate that um she the one thing she missed most, and if you live in Texas, you'll understand why, is brisket. She loves brisket. So she is creating a um, cell-based meat brisket um, so she can then enjoy eating brisket again. And I and I really applaud her for that. Brisket is going to be hard. And for those of you who've had good brisket, you know it's not just a mush meatball. It's multiple layers. It's It's beautiful. It's you know, and again, for those of you in Texas and you haven't had good brisket, um, I'd give it a shot because it, when it's juicy, it is perfect. But that's going to be a really, really difficult thing to, to um, pull off. So I've got some some links here. Um, oh, fun fact, too. Um, we, we mentioned at the onset that a lot of the, the technology we use for cell-based meat comes from the biomedical industry. So when I read the the protocols for biomedical industry and the protocols for cell-based meats, they're very similar. There's a lot of, you know, it's got to be sterile, clean, blah, 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 blah. The one thing that the biomedical doesn't have that cell-based meat has is it needs to be edible. You know, so if we're making a heart for a human, then one of the requirements there is not that it be edible, but if we're making a heart to be consumed on a plate for some sort of exotic meal through cell-based meat, it has to be edible. So I thought that was kind of funny when I saw that. Also, and it's bizarre too, and I'm sure this will be get sorted out, if you're creating um, a new heart muscle for a human being, you can use synthetic materials in that. If you're creating a heart to be consumed for whatever reason on a plate through cell-based meat, you can't use synthetic materials at this point in time. Yeah, so I'm sure these are answers that the questions that will be answered by smarter people than me. Um, anyway, that's that's what I have for you. Are we okay on time? Should, should I just blather for a little bit more to fill up the clock? And oh, actually, I'm taking that back. Victoria did have a question earlier. Um. Do we need to be concerned about growth hormones or anything of the sort in cell-based meat or plant-based products? Probably not. Um, if you look at FDA regulations, there's a lot of misinformation out there about um, hormones, and antibiotics in our food. You are not allowed to serve any animal product that has antibiotics in it. I mean, that's been a law for a rule for a long time. 
Um, anything that, that's in there growth hormone wise or other needs to be disclosed on the label. So you as a consumer can make an informed decision. Um, from the research I've done, I have not seen uh, growth hormones come up in the creation of these, these cells, these replicating cells. That's not to say it's, it's not there. I just haven't seen it as an outsider doing my research. Oh, exotics. Oh, it, anyway, I, let me end on this fun note here. <clears throat> so let's say, um, Heather, that, that your grandkids wake up in the morning, and they're adults at this point in time. They go downstairs, and I don't know how they, they maybe it's ocular, maybe it's thought patterns. But anyway, they, they call it their cup of coffee, but they're hungry as well. So they go down to their next generation Keurig machine and they look at the, the dashboard and they think or they ocularize, push a button and, and out pops a, an ostrich sausage with a flamingo cake next to it. And the, the machine itself has an immortal stem cell line in there. It's got some sort of um, non-mammalian um, media and, and scaffoldings all done. And within a matter of minutes, out pops this perfect piece of meat. So it's going to not only though no flamingos or um, other animals were killed in the creation of this thing, um, but it's actually going to taste better. It's going to have a better mouthfeel. It's going to have better flavoring than if you actually had taken the animal and prepared it up that way. Um, additionally, it's going to have the micronutrients that your body needs at that time in your life. And it could be you've got a cold, you need a vaccine delivery, that piece of meat could have that in there. Um, it could be that you've reached a certain age and there's a hormonal thing going on. It could have the right type of thing in there that will trigger the, the beneficial hormones in your body. So that that's the future. And if you think about it, that's just on earth here. And as many of you know, who are play the market, there's a company out there called Tesla, which um, <clears throat> has SpaceX. And um, Mr. Musk, I think, um, aspires to um, be a, a miner on Mars or a miner on a meteor or something like that and find a trillion dollar lithium vein that he can bring back here to Earth. As he sends those engineers out in space, it's, they're going to need to consume something. And it's, it can't just be a bag of powdered protein and a bag of powdered carbohydrates. These are human beings. And we appreciate a good meal and a cake from time to time. So if you think about the applications of cell-based meat in a, in a zero gravity or some sort of um, extraterrestrial environment, that could be a good benefit, too, to the cell-based meat movement. Yeah. So if you look at this slide here, um, they're already going down this line. I love Blue Nalu. Um, they've been a darling for investors lately. Keep an eye on them. What they're doing for seafood is fairly amazing. There's a company called Shayuk out of Singapore, which is leading with shrimp. They're also, both of them are kind of neck and neck cutting edges. Some other brands out there too. And I apologize if I haven't given you an appropriate shout out for all my friends that are out there. But uh, I do like what Lou has done at Blue Now. Lou. It's, it's fantastic. And I saw this Australian company. So I don't know what lion tastes like. I've never, I mean, I don't think I've ever eaten a cat of any, any feline, you know? So that could be interesting, you know? And who knows, maybe it opens up a whole new world for our cuisines. You know, maybe these things that we once considered pets, you know, once they're on the plate, they're good. Um, speaking of cats, there is um, a pet food company because much of the meat that we grow or a lot of the meat that we grow goes into pet food, pet treats. Um, they have created a stem cell line uh, of mice and they're making a cat food that is mouse. And they don't have to worry about ligaments or stuff like that because basically they take this blob of mouse cells and they dry it out and they extrude it into little cat bits. I don't know if they've done taste tests on cats. I know cats like to chase mice. I mean, I saw the cartoons when I grew up. Um, so maybe they just assume that mice was the optimal protein for cats. I don't know, but they're having a go at it. I guess next will be sparrows and other songbirds they can include in their diet and, and what have you. Um, cool. All right, Brant, great question here. Um, uh, novelty. I don't know. You know. Right now it's novelty. You know, it's going to get people's attention. People will try it. It's kind of like, you know, when you eat your first um, uh, ranch flavored cricket on a dare, you know, you want to try it and see what it is. I guarantee you though, some of those meats can be pretty good. I'm, I've been following along with the, the, um, the unexistence or how do you, how do you bring something back that's been um, extinct with the mastodons? I would not mind trying a mastodon burger, you know, or, or something like that. Um, I do have my favorite meats. I love elk. Um, 
there's another meat I love, but I can't say it out loud because my daughter would kill me. Um, but Orbillion, thank God, has created those stem cell lines, all those meats I love. So now there's a, a way I can hopefully in the near future safely consume those and not feel guilty about having my daughter stare me down when I'm trying to eat um, the cute little animal that I, I like eating. <laughs> And I'm an omnivore, just for the audience out there, if you hadn't figured that out. Um, but I do respect everyone's point of view, and you can consume whatever the heck you want to consume. All right, there's a couple couple um, little links here. Um, friends and family, you know, Ag Funder. If this is something that you, a topic that you like, if you want to learn about adjacent topics around this, Ag Funder is the best place to go for every bit of really cool information in the future of agriculture um, and food for the, the most part. Big Idea Ventures. Um, again, playing fan favorites. I know I've got a lot of other um, investment friends out there. Um, Big Idea Ventures, Abby, Tom, Andrew have done a phenomenal job of identifying the next generation of winners out there, um, getting behind them, giving them support, bringing them to market. Um, if you haven't gone to Big Idea Ventures website, please go there. Um, they are actually accepting the next set of applicants for their new cohort in alternative proteins. So um, this is both plant-based and cell-based. So if you fancy yourself a vegan chef and you've got something that everyone raves about, whether it's a sauce or a preparation, um, tell them to go and apply it to Big Idea Ventures because that that's really a rocket ship um, that can take you up there high. And then the last one's the Good Food Institute. Um, GFI, um, this is Andrew's point of view, but I think they bias more towards the, the plant-based um, alternative protein sector than they do the cell-based. Um, but, you know, they, they really have done a tremendous job of research, public opinions. I might not always agree with what they come out with because it's not what I want to hear, but it's empirically backed up. So I guess I got to take the bitter medicine from time to time and consume that. <laughs> What Heather's trying to say is, Andrew, it sounds like you walk on water. I really don't. You know, I've got a, a decent grasp of the subject. I'm really curious about it. I have a lot of friends in the subject. So I've got probably have more visibility than most on this this topic. But uh, it has really been a treat to come down here to DTC and be able to talk about something that's passionate about. You know, when you approached me, you said, you can talk about whatever you want. I'm like, really? Let me, let me see how far I can push that envelope. And sure enough, thank you again. Thank you, audience, for tuning in. And thank you to the folks that will watch this later. Um, this has really been a pleasure.